uh, I get the honor of being able to introduce Jason, who's going to lead us into our third conversation in our teaching series on First Peter. And so everybody, here is Jason Leader. Thank you, Maddie. So good evening, everyone. As Maddie mentioned, my name is Jason Leader, and I get to be one of the church family pastors here at Epiphany Station. And if you're not sure what the church family is, and you want to learn more about that, on your way out, you can stop at the welcome station and, and ask more questions and see what that's all about. Now, before we get into the teaching, today's a special day. Today's a special day, and it's not because it's pushing 100 degrees outside and you storm that weather to get here and leave the comfort of your air-conditioned home. So thank you for being here for that. But it's a special day because it's Father's Day. Thank you. So for the fathers here, I just want to say thank you for one, for being here, making it through that heat. But also to the fathers watching online, there might be a little bit of envy because they're in their comfort of their homes where it's cool, where you guys went out. But it's Father's Day, so just want to say happy Father's Day. And speaking of Father's Day, we're here to learn what our Heavenly Father wants us to learn. And that is how we are called to, to live holy, to live a holy life. Now, if you consider yourself a Christian, you probably find that it's very difficult to do just that, to live a holy life. And the reason is because before we found out about Jesus, before we found out about the truth and we learned the truth, and by the truth I mean Jesus, we only live for ourselves. We had nobody to live for other than ourselves. And now that we know the truth, Everything's changed. Everything's switched. At least I hope it's switching in our lives because that's the intent behind it. So instead of living for ourselves, now we are called to live and glorify God through Jesus. That's our calling. Now that comes with a great responsibility. That means there's certain parts of us that we have to let go, leave behind as we follow Christ. But the good news is, obviously is Jesus but we gain so much more than what we have to give up. Like we, we do have to give up a lot, but what we gain from that is so much grander, so much more than what we could ever give up. Now, throughout the summer, we're going to be digging into uh, the, the series, which will last the full summer, and it's on First Peter. If you missed it, the first two weeks, Maddie opened it up. We could watch it online. And today, as Maddie mentioned, I get to lead us into the conversation. It's really just carrying over from the last two weeks. And I get the privilege to dig into the next 12 verses. The first Peter. Now, if you're anything like me, when I dig into the Bible and I'm reading scripture, sometimes I find it kind of hard to understand, to grasp what the words are trying to tell me. Like, it's easy to read at service level, besides some of the names in the Old <laughs> Testament, but outside of that, it's still difficult to understand what the meaning is of some of the Scripture. And for that reason, and for the fact that I'm guessing there's many other people like me that have an issue when it comes to learning what I'm supposed to learn, we're going to break it down today. We're going to look at the verses, 12 verses, 1 Peter it's going to be verses 13 through 25. And I'm going to break it down into three chunks. And the purpose behind that is because there's three separate individual things that we are to learn from that. Three very specific things that we're called to do with that. So I'm going to start with verse 13. We'll just jump right into it. Verse 13 States, so prepare your minds for action and exercise, self-control. Put all your hope in the grace of salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now, now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. So to break this down, right away, Peter calls us to live out this holy life, uh, to live 
a life that is holy, to be in self-control. Now, a thought came to me when I was putting this teaching together. Aside from being a believer in Christ, which is easy enough, what else should I be doing that is pleasing to God? Like, what else can I be doing to help with my walk in Christ and be obedient? What else is needed for me to be successful in my own life? And what I mean by being successful is how we live, how I live, to be obedient. Now, I drop the hint. It's one word, so it's easy, easy to think of, but it's very complicated, very hard to do. And that one thing is to be obedient. It says in Scripture, on verse 14, we must live as God's obedient children. Obedience means that we must obey his commands. And all throughout the Bible, it's threaded. It's threaded throughout the Bible that we have to be obedient. For instance, in John 14, verse 15, this is Jesus talking. He states, if you love me, obey my commandments. And then further down in John 14, and verse 23, Jesus continues to say, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home each or with each of them. So again, we're required. We're required to be obedient. Yet, over and over and over again, we find ourselves slipping back into old habits and old ways, and we stop being obedient. We, re, we uh, react to situations differently when we're not being obedient in ways that are not glorifying God. We simply put ourselves in front of God instead of God in front of us first. And I hate to say this, but a lot of times we don't even think about God at all in certain situations. So obedience is needed for us to be successful and have a successful life. Now, successful, what is that? Successful means that we got to love. We have to love everyone. We have to love our God, and we have to love people as they're our brothers and sisters. No matter how hard it could be, that's what we're called to do. It's also forgiveness. In order for us to love, obviously, we have to forgive. We ask for forgiveness, and we also have to forgive. Then we got to think about a successful life would mean that we're switching the way we think, that we operate. We're switching how we walk, how we talk, and how we live. To be successful, that means all that is in us so that we could glorify God. That's a successful life. And being obedient to God is not a one and done thing. It's not just a checklist. It's not like... Most of us probably have Alexa app. We go on our phone, right, and we're going to just turn on the Alexa app and scroll and say, you know what, God, I'm not choosing to be obedient on that, but uh, I'll scroll up a little bit, found something that's easy enough. I'm going to be obedient on that, and I'm good. That's not what obedience is. We have to be obedient to God at all times, not just a one and done. And the reason we have to be obedient is because God is holy, and we're called to live our holy life. So, let's move on to the second chunk, verse 17, and it states this. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. In this chunk here, there's really three key things that 
that we need to discuss here and bring to surface. One is that God judges and rewards us for what we do. On what we do. Now think about that because I believe that what we do is based on our beliefs. What we do is based on the things that we believe. For instance, many of us have jobs here. Many of us work on the belief that come paycheck time, we're going to get our due, the pay, right? So our actions of working is based on the belief that we're going to get paid. Another example would be disciplining children. For those that have children, the reason why you discipline your children is because you want them to be safe. You want them to be better as they grow up. You want them to act and behave appropriately. And you discipline based on the belief that they're going to listen, even though it doesn't always happen. But there's that belief there. And then there's indulgence. Switch gears here. There's the indulgence where at times... We want to do things our way. We want to indulge in the things that are sinful. We want to do things that aren't pleasing to God because we want to do them. And for the moment that we decide to do it, it's because there's a belief that it's better that we do it. Or there's a belief that we need it or we want it. The desire is there. Again, indulgence is based on this belief, even if it's for the wrong reasons. So the trick is to get us to a spot where We think of Jesus, and we think to ourselves what he means to us, which should drive our actions, which should drive the way we walk, talk, think, and live. If we believe in Jesus, why would we not then allow that to change how we live? Certainly God knows if we believe Jesus exists or not and what he stands for, he knows everything. He sees all, but it's the actions, the actions that God looks at to reward us or to judge us. So if we believe in Jesus and and we think that's all we have to do is believe, do you think that if we don't walk the walk, that if we just talk that we believe in Jesus, do you think God would be pleased with that? Of course not. He wants us to obey. He wants the obedience. He wants to transform us. He wants us to change. And the way to do that is obedience. It's it's listening to God. Now, Peter continues on. The second point of this is having a reverent fear of God. Personally, I think sometimes, I know I do, and I think the majority, if not all of us, do this. Sometimes we don't think of God in that fashion. We don't have a reverent fear of him. Instead, we think of him as a buddy or a friend. We'll pray to him and we'll live our life as if he's just a buddy without that reverent fear. So we take that casual approach sometimes. Now, something else to think of is Jesus and the ransom that he is. God gave a ransom, that is Jesus, to die for us so that his blood could cover our sins. The other, the third thing on here talks about the emptiness, the empty life. Think about how empty our lives would be if we didn't have Jesus. Just for a moment, how impactful is that if you could really think about if there was no Jesus, how empty would you feel? We'll move on to the final chunk, starting with verse 21. And it says, Through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, 
People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field, and the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. So we're clean. We're, we're cleansed from our sins when we believe in Jesus. When we believe the truth, when we start to get away from our ways and we start learning more and more about the truth and we start following the truth, meaning Jesus, we are then cleansed from our sins. And then it also talks about how we're born again, born from above. Again, that goes back to the belief in Jesus. So as we believe in Jesus and the fact that he died for our sins, we are then reborn from above. And with that, we are to love deeply. We're, we're to love one another. We're, we're, we're to love God more sincerely, with more depth. We're supposed to love one another like brothers and sisters. Now, you probably each have your own brother or sister that don't necessarily want to love as much, but we're called to love just as much. Now, there's a lot here. We went through 12 verses, broke it out in three different chunks. So I just want to recap this real quick before we head out this evening. The first part of this, Peter tells us that we need to have obedience, obedience to God. So what is it, what is it that you are doing or not doing that is not obedient to God? I want you to put some thought into that. Perhaps it's a sin. Perhaps it's a sin that you just continue to carry on and on and you can't seem to shake. Or maybe it's something that you are felt led to do, but you just decided to take a sidestep and not do it. If it was going to be pleasing to God. So I ask you to think about that. Pray to God that he opens your eyes. That he helps you to be obedient so that you know what you need to do to please him and to live an obedient life. And we have to live a holy life of self-control because God is holy. Then the second chunk that we covered talks about how God is going to be there to judge or reward us by what we do. We need to start acting on that belief based on the belief that God loved us first. And it shows that with Jesus. So is there somebody in your life that perhaps you feel you have not loved totally or you could love better? Maybe it's somebody in your life right now that maybe there's a little bit of a distance between you and them. Maybe you need to make amends. Maybe it's something that's happened. Pray to God that he'll give you the strength to go ahead and reach out to that individual or those people to show them that love. Now, God loved us first because he sent his son to cover our sins, Jesus, with his blood. It is our actions, not simply just the belief in Christ, that glor glorifies God. So we must act in obedience. Now, again, I mentioned that it's hard to do as Christians, but one thing to think about to get you there is not to take the casual approach. Don't think of God as that buddy. Have that reverent fear of God. That'll help you get there to be that obedient child of his. So we must love one another regardless how hard it is. In verse 19, talking about the blood of Christ, states this, just to recap this real quick, go back because we're going to get a little bit of personal uh, after this, and it states it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. I mentioned I was going to get personal. I want you to think about these as I throw these questions out there. Thinking about the blood of Christ, how precious is that to you specifically? Do you take the casual approach to that? Do you think, okay, that's for everybody, but not necessarily for me? Think about how precious is that blood to you. 
Consider the beating that he endured. Is that not a sign of love for you? Or is it just for somebody else? Put some thought into that. His death, died on the cross, the ultimate sacrifice, do you not feel that that is for you? Or do you? Things to think about. How precious is the blood of Jesus to you? So our ability to love people and and live a holy life is based on beliefs. The reason why I ask those questions is because how you approach that, if it's personal for you or not, is the best indicator, a predictor, that you're willing to love people, willing to love God, and willing to obey We know we're sinful. We know how much sin we have. We know that we need Jesus to cover our sins. You personally know what that is for you. How much is that blood worth? How much does it resonate with you that it's so precious? Because if you think about it and and you, you feel the love of that, then we need to be lifting that up. We need to be lifting up the fact that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, died for our sins, cleansed us from, from everything we've ever done and, and anything that we're going to do that is wrong. We need to start walking and acting and behaving as if we believe. That's what Jesus did for us. And that's one way of being obedient to God. So put some time into that, as I mentioned. Now we're about to wrap up our teaching here this evening, but before we do, we, we want to do communion. And with communion, we do this at Epiphany Station as a belief. It's a response to the belief that we do believe what Jesus stands for, that he is the ultimate sacrifice, that he is our way into heaven, that we need him to be pleasing in order to be pleasing to God. So if you haven't taken communion here before, uh, what we do is this is going to be the end of the teaching. There's not going to be anything else that closes us out after communion. So you can stay as long as you want. We don't have another service after this. Or you can just get up and walk out when you're ready to leave. But we have both bread and juice up here. We also have the gluten-free options on both sides of the stage. And our worship team's up here. They're going to lead us in a song while we take communion. And put some thought into those questions. How precious is the blood of Christ to you? What sins do you come in with that you need to leave at the altar and ask for forgiveness for and repent? Communion is personal. Maddie mentioned this. It's something that is between you and God. So take your time. Don't rush. Let me pray us out, and then we'll go ahead and and take communion together. Father God, we're just so grateful for the fact that we have a, a loving God, one that knows the flesh that we are, knows the sins that we carry, know the sins that we've had in the past, the sins that we have in the future. You know that it's hard for us as Christians to live a holy life, but yet you command that from us. But you're able to give us scripture, you're able to give us one another to learn from, to help us in our growth. Help us in our journey and our walk with Christ. We're a powerful God, one that knows all. There's nothing we can't hide from you. You give us free will so that we could come to you in the times that are most needed. So I pray, God, that if there's any sins in here tonight that we're not sure if we want to surface and bring to you, God, that we do just that. We pray that we're able to give it to you, knowing 
knowing that it's already covered because your, your willingness to send Jesus to the cross for us. So we thank you, Lord, for your time tonight. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for being a loving God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.